Uh, just to set the stage, um, we're going to divide the kind of moderated portion into four broad themes. I think sort of the first will be the end goals of China strategy. The second is sort of the Taiwan scenarios. Third is prioritization and trade-offs in strategy. And finally, we'll turn to the home front. So with that, I think we'll begin with the question of end states. And all the folks on this panel have written incisively about US-China strategy from different perspectives. But what is the end goal of US competition with China? Should victory be defined in terms of the relationship we want with China, as some suggest? Uh, should it be the kind of government China has, as others suggest? Or should it be defined uh, in terms of American interests, like keeping the region free from hegemony? So let me turn to uh, Matt Pottinger first. Matt, uh, you and, and Congressman Gallagher helped reframe the debate around this question, around the question of what it means to win competition and what the end states should be. So uh, what do you think uh, the end goal of US-China policy should be? And, and what does victory in concrete terms mean to you? Great. Hey, Rush, it's good to see you, Bridge. Great to see you and, and Bonnie, too. How are you guys? Uh, I, look, I, I think that we need to uh, define, um, first of all, pursue victory as opposed to merely managing uh, a competition. Uh, you know, managing a competition uh, it sounds a lot like the 1970s detente policies that uh, I think uh, have, have uh, turned out to have failed uh, when, when they were pursued against the Soviet Union. Um, and we, we should actually be looking to, to win this competition. Winning the competition does not mean um, war and it doesn't mean capitulation. It's still uh, something in between. Uh, but but it's very much aimed at uh, ensuring that Beijing becomes persuaded that it cannot win either a hot war against us or our, our friends, uh, nor can it win a cold war, which it's already waging against us and our friends. And, and I think that um, if Beijing becomes persuaded, as the Soviets ultimately did, that they cannot win um, this uh, the, in their achieving their global aims, not just domestic or regional, but global aims, um, that, uh, that, that in fact may end up leading to a different form of government in China, but that's not what Gallagher and I were, uh, were calling for, regime change. But we think it's important to look at uh, how the Soviet Cold War uh, played out. Um, and learn some of the lessons from that, because the, the similarities between the Chinese system and the Soviet system uh, are underestimated in our view. Uh, we think that um, th that uh, if, if we look at what George Kennan wrote at the beginning of the Cold War, if you look at uh, NSC 68, also early in the Cold War and the Truman administration, and, and you, you draw a line all the way through the end of the Cold War, really with the strategy of the Reagan administration, those administrations were not seeking uh, a stalemate. Uh, th those strategies did not call for a stalemate. They called for undermining the sources of Soviet aggression, and we should be doing the same with respect to China. Well, thanks, Matt. And uh, for the benefit of the audience, Matt and I had a chance to exchange views along with others in the pages of Foreign Affairs, uh, courtesy of our wonderful editor, Dan kurtz Fallon, who I think is listening in. Um, maybe I'll turn out a bridge. Uh, I think you probably take a slightly different position from Matt on the question of end states. I think if you said at time that your theory of victory is something like, maybe like detente, but from a position mm -hmm. of strength. So I guess my question for you uh, would be, would such a detente be stable? Because I think implicit, Matt, in your articulation is the idea it would not be stable. And what does the content bridge of that detente mean to you? What does it look like in practice? Sure. Well, thanks, uh, Rush, and, and thanks for including me in this important event. And congratulations on your on your service and your and your uh, you know kickoff here of this major important initiative. And great to be on with Bonnie and my good friend, uh, good to all good friends, uh, uh, Matt, and also referring to uh, Mike's uh, his piece with with Matt. I do have a somewhat different view, and maybe uh, you're the real academic, but I'll, I do believe that. Um, sort of theoretical, kind of broad theoretical constructs are uh, illuminating, at least on the right side of the spectrum. There was a good article I'd commend to people's attention in City Journal magazine by a guy named Jordan McGillis that kind of laid out sort of different tribes on the China issue on the Republican side. And um, the kind of, I would say, neo-Reaganite might be, uh, you know, Reagan himself was, was maybe more of a realist than I think people sometimes, or at least his policy was more realistic than people often appreciate. That might be the way that I, at least I would define Mike and Matt's piece, obviously, he can speak for himself. Um, my, my sort of view is, is the conservative realist. And so what I would say to you is victory is never final. 
in the sense that what was the victory with the Soviet Union? Well, it was great that we won. And I think Ronald Reagan did a great, great job and others played a very important part along the way. Um, but of course, now we have Vladimir Putin, right, which in some, is actually worse than what we faced, certainly under Mikhail Gorbachev. And at least, you know, there's an argument that even before that, um, and that that basically stems from the fact that in my view, Russia and China's interests are generally driven by non-ideological elements. Obviously, there's an ideological element, and you've written very eloquently about that, Rush. But basically, if you listen to what Xi Jinping and the Chinese government are actually at least publicly saying, it's the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, a stronger position for the Chinese people. That has essentially nothing to do with Marxism. If anything, it's actually the antithesis of at least classical Marxism and the critiques of imperialism and so forth. In fact, in some ways, I fear that China today might be bearing out Lenin's theory of imperialism, and we can go into that. But what that means is that what we have to be realistic about what we expect. Detente is not, is not satisfying. It's not a final, a final solution to the problem, but I don't think that's realistic. And I think it's actually far too dangerous to pursue it because as I understand it, the Chinese have heard some of the arguments about victory and regime change. And but you mentioned foreign affairs and Dan, uh, who, who I agree is fantastic. He, he published a piece by Bob Kaplan uh, and me uh, uh, back in 2020, making the argument against this type of, of policy. It's too dangerous. It's not critical for American interests, which American interests, in my view, if you go back to George Kennan, what George Kennan was saying at the National Defense University or Nicholas Spikeman, they were saying we need to prevent a potentially hostile state from controlling one of the key industrialized regions of the, of the world. Whether that state is coming, I'm anti-communism, I loathe communism, I hope the Chinese people become free. But you know, just a, a point in that respect is that it was actually the Kuomintang government of the Republic of China that came up with a nine dash line. So I don't think we would solve all of our all of our problems. So we should, we have more modest names where I disagree with someone like my, my friend, Neil Ferguson, uh, a fantastic thinker, a very, very clear headed thinker on these things is I think we need to, and this is where I very much agree with Matt and Mike, we need to approach Dayton, we need to pursue Dayton from a position of manifest military strength in particular. And this is where I would differ from, from Kirk Campbell's, Deputy Secretary of State Campbell's presentation earlier, which we may want to get into. But I think this is a very important discussion. Sometimes people say, oh, it's sort of theoretical, et cetera, et cetera. We have, but no, but it tells you the kind of policy you should pursue, how much risk to take on, how to deal with other countries, et cetera. Okay. Uh, Matt, I'm going to come back to you in a moment to, to weigh back in, but I want to turn first to Bonnie, um, who I know also has written about this and has thoughts uh, on the question of end states. So Bonnie, maybe you could offer your own perspective here too. Sure. Uh, Rush, thank you very much. Also very delighted to be here and also being on stage with uh, both Matt and Bridge, who I actually worked with and for in the Pentagon. <laughs> uh, in terms of thinking through... Uh, end states for China, I think there are a couple of questions that we need to think through. And to, uh, to Bridget's point, we need to think about what can the United States realistically achieve given our capabilities. And here, I think I really appreciate Matt clarifying that your paper was not about regime change, because I think trying to affect domestic policy change in China is probably the hardest, much harder than trying to affect how China operates internationally. And to that, I think we're probably all on the same page in agreeing that our priorities should be affecting China's external behavior. And to the extent we could hope for change internally within China, but that shouldn't be our priority. The second point I want, would want to make is when we look at what we want to achieve for in terms of an end state for competition or whatever you want to call that with China, we also need to take into account what our allies and partners would be on board for. And I think both Matt and Bridge may have mentioned this. I don't think our allies and partners, nor do we want a or hot war with China. And to the extent that constrains our options of how much we can push China on, because I think the, the more we push, the more in some ways we might be losing some of our allies and partners. Uh, the last thing I would, um, perhaps, and perhaps maybe this is where I may disagree a little bit more with Bridge and align more with Matt is I do think that if we were to achieve a, um, a world where we want to maintain the existing values or not, we probably can't just have a relationship in which China could think that when it looks at its power and it looks at its power with its own uh, friends and allies, that it's about on par with the United States. I actually think we need to have a bit more of a of a picture in which China believes, or we, or, and, and also our allies and partners understand that we have more of a significant advantage over China. Because to the extent that we are more on parity, I believe that that would create more freedom for China to act both on its periphery, but also internationally. Well, thanks. Um, you know, I guess I'll come back to you, Matt, now with just an additional question. You've heard perspectives from, from Bridge and from Bonnie. I'm trying to stay out of the discussion as the moderator, so I'm going to keep to, keep to that practice. Uh, so how do you respond to the idea that uh, that sort of there's, you, you know, there's risk inherently in pursuing something beyond managing competition, that, that the idea is that you could manage competition while at the same time 
in the process of managing it take more competitive steps than you could otherwise take safely if you didn't try to manage it at all? Is there a competitive advantage? You know, Bonnie just mentioned the allied and partner component, but is there also a competitive advantage in the bilateral component that where you, where you actually try to explain what you're doing, what you're not doing, you try to have diplomacy, you use these basic you know, tenets of interaction between states to just make sure that your counterparty doesn't take the worst possible view of everything you're trying. Is there a value in that? I know you yourself tried that in the Trump administration, Matt, from a position of leadership. So could you speak to that in addition to maybe kind of uh, Bonnie and, and, and Matt uh, Bridges' point? Then we'll move on to the next topic. Sure. Yeah, look, Britt, it, first, first to your point, Rush, I mean, I, I'm strongly in favor of the President of the United States speaking frequently uh, to Xi Jinping. Uh, Xi Jinping is the only person who can make consequential decisions in that system. And the only way to reliably uh, transmit information to him is by talking to him directly, not by relying on toadies and sycophants and frightened officials, frankly, uh, who are, you know, as likely to get purged tomorrow as, as they are to, uh, you know, make a difficult point to their boss. So I'm a strong believer in that aspect of managing uh, the relationship with China, no question. What I think we have to be a little more, maybe I'd say less naive about is the idea that uh, that our sending, you know, five cabinet officers to China as, as the Biden administration did last year, uh, the, the idea that that was going to somehow coax China into a more cooperative relationship is uh, historically uh, uh, ignorant. And, and actually we're even seeing that the, the so-called fruits of, of this engagement last year are, are not amounting to very much. And actually I think have sent a, a signal of weakness to Beijing. Beijing has become more aggressive, more difficult in the time since um, uh, the Biden administration began its, its uh, what it called intensive diplomacy below the level of Xi Jinping and the president of the United States. Uh, Beijing tripled down on its support for Russia's war, really beginning last March, March of 2023. Uh, it, you know, by Secretary Blinken's own admission, China has become overwhelmingly the number one material supporter of the war and may have actually changed the course of the war in, in Russia's favor uh, through that support. And Beijing is now also hosting Hamas delegations. They're bringing terrorists to Beijing while they, they've also been the number one uh, material propaganda and diplomatic supporter of Iran uh, as it wages proxy war uh, around the Middle East. And then you can look to Venezuela, and, and it's, uh, Venezuela is now threatening to invade its neighbor. Beijing is uh, signaling sympathy for, uh, for that approach. So I just think it, it's, it's naive for us to think that, uh, that we're gonna coax uh, a, a Leninist uh, totalitarian dictatorship into some kind of a cooperative relationship, but we should be talking to them at the leadership level. I mean, uh, just very quickly on, on Bridges' point, Bridge and I have a, have a fundamental disagreement about the role of ideology uh, in, in with Beijing. I, I think it's a very important point, even though there's a real politic sort of, uh, you know, Machiavellian uh, imperial streak as well. But the reason why ideology is important is because it gives us clues into the vulnerabilities of China's uh, strategy. And I think we, we, we shouldn't ignore uh, those, uh, those, uh, so, those signals and uh, critical vulnerabilities. The only last point I would make is that I, I don't agree with, with you, Bridge, on the idea that Putin is, is, is worse than, uh, the, than uh, the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. I mean, Putin's economy is like, I don't know, you know, two trillion bucks or something, you know, versus, you know, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a tiny fraction of the U.S. economy. In fact, I think that if you take all of our allies together uh, with the United States, we've got like a $60 trillion dollar a uh, cumulative economy versus a two trillion dollar Russian pipsqueak. Putin can't do anything. Putin is an aftershock sort of symptom of uh, of of the end of the Cold War. He would not be able to do anything that he's doing right now if not for the massive juggernaut in the form of Beijing and Xi Jinping and, and the material support that he's providing for Putin. It, it's it's not a coincidence that Putin signed his No Limits. Uh, a pact with, with Xi Jinping less than three weeks before he decided to, decide to launch his full-blown invasion. So what we're really dealing with is Beijing at, with uh, Putin as, as the junior uh, partner. Or I agree with that, Matt. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. 
Well, uh, this conversation could continue, and you can follow it online. There's some, <laughs> including on Twitter or X, as it's called now, and in the pages of Foreign Affairs, where there was a spirit of debate. I'll just say one thing because it's my prerogative, um, which is, which is, Matt. I think that the 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 critique of diplomacy mis, uh, misunderstands its purpose. Its purpose was not to change China's approach. It wasn't to change China. It wasn't necessarily to solve all the problems that we have. It was, in fact, to create the space for a more competitive approach by explaining that when you take those competitive steps, they have a limit and logic to them. They are not designed to fundamentally cause, as Bridge mentioned earlier, regime change or to destroy the Chinese Communist Party's economy. They're basically serious competitive steps that we're not going to apologize for, but we are going to explain. So I think of that level of diplomacy, including the lower level, again, not to solve problems, but to give them information. And as moderator's prerogative, we will now move on. So the, <laughs> oh next, the, next topic, the next topic will be even more lively, but we're going to go up in order of liveliness. It's going to be Taiwan, of course. So this is an issue where uh, you know, most agree. The key U.S. objective is to deter a conflict that could cost the global economy. I think Bloomberg has done some research on this. Uh, at least $10 trillion, that's a conservative estimate, more than 10% of global GDP. So that would be a number greater than, as a percentage of GDP, even the Great Depression. So when Kurt Campbell, the Deputy Secretary of State, was here saying this could cause a kind of Great Depression level event, I think that's what he was referring to. So I want to talk to, to Bonnie first. We'll start with you, Bonnie. Um, you know, you've written a lot about this. You've thought a lot about this. Your team runs tabletop exercises. How urgent is the risk of conflict in the Taiwan Strait? How optimistic or pessimistic are you about U.S. prospects if one breaks out based on your own exercises? And I think second, related to this, your team just concluded a very thoughtful analysis, uh, I thought it was excellent, of quarantine scenarios, which you distinguish from blockade scenarios because they have a law enforcement component. Um, but there's a debate, you know, how likely are quarantine or blockade scenarios, uh, Bridget and I have talked about this, mm -hmm. versus invasion scenarios. And I want to ask you how you think about all of that. So with that extremely meaty start, uh, maybe over to you, Bonnie, to kick us off. Sure, thank you very much, Rush. And thanks for uh, flagging our recent report, which of course we want more folks to read. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at the risk of conflict or crisis in Taiwan Street, I would say the next 10 years are, are going to be higher than our past 10 years for at least two main reasons. One is if you look at China's capability, uh, there's no doubt that China's military capability continues to increase. And that capability isn't just in terms of the People's Liberation Army, but it's also in terms of its law enforcement, its Coast Guard. Uh, as, as we look forward, we know that I, I'm not saying that China will use force in 2027, but we, we do know that Xi Jinping has set that as a goal for China to have the military capability to be able to engage in a large scale amphibious invasion of Taiwan. So that capability is one factor that China will take into account. The second factor is China's intent and China's assessment of the situation in Taiwan Strait. And here we do know that China assesses the current president of Taiwan, William Lai, in the most negative light possible. We've seen Chinese Politburo member and Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, label uh, William Lai as a traitor. We, in the past couple of weeks, have seen, actually it was last week, right, uh, China released new judicial guidelines on how China will punish um, Taiwan, in what China calls die hard Taiwan independence. Uh, uh, folks, and in particular, China intends more punishment on the leaders of Taiwan independence. And China didn't quite name William Lai as this, but I think those who are those of us who are following this are seeing this as being labeled and targeted against William Lai. These are measures that China did not take um, under President Tsai Ing-wen in the prior past eight years. So uh, just putting together both the will and the intent, uh, sorry, the intent and the capabilities, we should expect more Chinese escalation, more Chinese coercion against Taiwan. In terms of what we may expect in the near term versus longer term, I'm of the view that a quarantine could have could happen anytime because right now, to be honest, we wouldn't have great responses from the US side of China were to engage in a quarantine of Taiwan. And that, that there's various ways that China could construct that quarantine, but it would not be necessarily that costly for China. But a quarantine differs significantly from a blockade and invasion. So I would say that it's much more costly for China to engage in blockade invasion. And those are probably uh, options that China would reserve at a later time, potentially closer uh, to 2027 or later than in the immediate future. Well, thanks, Bonnie. And as I look out across the room, I saw many people nodding. Many people have worked on this issue set, too. So I hope in Q&A, uh, some of you will jump in. Um, let me turn to you, Matt. Uh, you just finished uh, the book, The Boiling Mode. I think it's out formally next week. Some of your co-authors are here in the room. I see Ivan Canapathy, my former NSC colleague, uh, who you hired many, many years ago uh, here as well. So I want to ask you, you know, what, how do you respond to the kind of question 
of the likely uh, high-end scenarios we're going to face? How do you think about the quarantine scenario? And what fundamentally, I guess this is what your book gets to, what fundamentally should the United States do uh, you know, to deter those situations, those scenarios, but also if those scenarios materialize, what do we do after? So maybe Matt, over to you uh, to, to take on yeah, those sure. questions. Yeah, Bonnie, congrats on your report. I, I, I saw a few reports about it, but I, I promise I'm going to read it um, uh, this week. <laughs> and uh, because my, my co-authors and I, I'm glad Ivan's there. Ivan and I were actually just meeting with President Lai uh, last week in Taiwan together and with uh, his new cabinet. Um, we, we spent a lot of time in the course of writing uh, The Boiling Moat, wrestling with blockade scenarios and gray zone uh, scenarios and, and these sort of things along the spectrum, including a quarantine. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that some of these exercises that we're seeing right now, uh, like the one right after President Lai's inauguration last month, uh, I, I call them sort of flash blockades. They're sort of you know limited duration exercises that Beijing can reverse. Uh, it can do them you know progressively over longer periods of times to demonstrate that it can threaten. The, the flow of critical materials, especially energy supplies into Taiwan. Um, I, I think that that ultimately we should be we should be tabletop exercising for uh, quarantine scenarios together with uh, Japan and Australia, Taiwan, South Korea uh, and in and, and Europe, because quarantines are very, very difficult to uh, enforce without ultimately being push to move up the escalation ladder to those to those scenarios that, as Bonnie just mentioned, would become more costly, uh, not only for Taiwan, but actually for China itself. So we should be figuring out, you know, looking at some of the quarantines in the past. Remember when the United States imposed a quarantine in the early 60s uh, around Cuba to prevent uh, missiles and nukes from traveling from the Soviet Union into Cuba, it, it, that, that quarantine ultimately worked, but it was extremely difficult to enforce. Had the Soviets simply uh, continued running uh, the quarantine, it probably would have forced the United States to have to move up the escalation ladders in ways that, that, that I think made, made everybody queasy on you know, both sides of, of the Atlantic. So, um, uh, but I'm really looking forward to reading your piece, uh, Bonnie. Well, thanks, Matt. And that takes me to bridge. Um, so we've just had this quarantine blockade invasion discussion. I guess mm -hmm. I'd like to get your sense, Bridge, of what you worry most about. I think it's it's invasion. Mm -hmm. but how do you think also about the possibility of quarantine and blockade scenarios being something the U.S. should prepare for? How would you suggest responding to them? And I guess a second related question, if I could. Um, you've been very public about sort of the urgency of the Taiwan challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think many people in this room probably share that sense of urgency. What would you, I think you've said also that we can't really maintain as Americans our quality of life if Taiwan mm -hmm. falls. But you've also been clear that the U.S. should be careful about the kinds of rhetoric it uses mm -hmm. on Taiwan, not make incendiary political statements because it's not in our strategic interest. Mm -hmm. So one question I have for you, kind of going beyond the discussion we just had with Bonnie and Matt is, when we say that we need Taiwan to sort of be the way it is to not have American quality of life erode, do you see that as a call for essentially permanent separation or something that'd be provocative politically to China as well? So maybe you could take on those yeah, questions. Yeah, so no, and it, uh, because, and that's important, I'll get order. to it. So, so yeah. permit me to kind of develop because I think, and I think it's very important to compare what I'm saying uh, to what Deputy Secretary Campbell, and I think in a lot of ways his speech was, argue, I mean, if I arguing the against the kinds of arguments that I've been making, and I think one of the, there are a couple of really key statements in his speech, most of which I found. And Bridge, we will come to the Europe question in a moment. But too, so. but but I think it's important. Okay. One right. one of which is 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 very important. Uh, several of which were very important. Most of which was was unobjectionable and, and commendable, deserves to be lauded and supported. But was he said that he does not think a near term attack on Taiwan is something that we really need to worry about. I don't think that's a rational judgment. Now, Deputy Secretary Campbell has access to far greater uh, intelligence information than I do, but fundamentally, based on my experience and kind of analytically, I don't think that there is intelligence that could give rel a truly reliable uh, confidence that we do not need to worry about it. Why? Well, a couple. most of what we're gonna see is gonna happen in plain sight. And I'll build on what Bonnie said, and I know Matt basically agrees with this. You have the intent for irredentist reasons uh, as well as I think, you know, sort of broader ambitions to break out of the first island chain. Um, and is China actually moving to resolve the Taiwan issue in its favor? And I believe it's taking a series of very costly signals to do exactly that. One is conventional military buildup, both to resolve the Taiwan issue itself, but also that shows that, Taiwan, that China is assuming that it has subsumed Taiwan over time, aircraft carriers, space architecture. If you read the defense press, 
The head of the Space Force says the Chinese are developing uh, space capabilities to project military power much farther away, basing architecture. That is a costly signal that China thinks it has broken out reliably of the first island chain. The nuclear buildup, which I believe the only plausible explanation or certainly a big part of it, has to be the potential for a large conflict with the United States. Um, the uh, economic resilience, China is aware of the Bloomberg analysis and the threats from people like Deputy Secretary Campbell, however credible, and I question how credible they really are, that there would be punishing economic sanctions. Yet China, in the midst of incredible economic headwinds, is doing delete A and trying to make the economy more resilient. And politically conditioning, and this is where I agree with Matt, let's listen to what, and Rush, Let's listen to, and Bonnie, actually, let's listen to what the Chinese are actually saying, not just do something. We bring people right, together. Uh, that's real. Uh, so all of that together. And then I say, well, I mean, Kurt Campbell's boss, Tony Blinken, who's nobody's idea of a super China hawk, has said the Chinese have given the instruction for 2027 and moved the calendar forward. And Bill Burns has also said that and stood by it. So we have all the signals. And what my view, I've never said, and please anybody call me out if I have, has, I've never said, I know the Chinese will move, but I'm saying that we don't know. And by the way, there's reporting in the Wall Street Journal late last year that US mil that intelligence sources on China are very limited. And frankly, I think if you look at the history of the, the Soviet Union and so forth, it's very rare to get truly reliable information, especially from a closed Leninist system. Xi Jinping, I doubt, trusts anybody, including probably the members of his own family. So we have to assume that we don't know. And this is why my pinned tweet is whoever's elected president, I hope it's President Trump, but whoever is elected in November has to assume that it could happen. And so this gets to the other point, which is what do we need to be worried about? And my view is quarantines are not decisive. I'm, I'm listening to Matt very eloquently recount the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but there was also the impending threat of invasion of, the, of, the, of Cuba, of the US invasion of Cuba. There was also the possibility for the war to escalate to the general nuclear level. That was, as Jim Schlesinger put, the big stick in the closet. And my view, I could see quarantine kind of situations, and I think that deserves um, uh, a serious analysis. But it's not, I, I think China could only rationally, and I, I, Matt knows a lie better than I do, but I met with him uh, in April and I've seen what he said. There's no way this guy's gonna voluntarily give it up because they blocked like, I don't know, banana imports into Taiwan or whatever it is. You know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do that, and that's very clear. So if China's gonna solve it, it's going to go to invasion. And the problem with the blockade, and this is similar to what both Eli Ratner and Randy Shriver, who are both fantastic thinkers and, and deserve to be listened to, not, not, not infallible, but they've said a blockade is not the most, the most rational strategy. I know that you, I think you have a somewhat different view, but I think if I'm thinking myself, if I were sitting in Beijing and trying to solve this problem, I would say, if, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna take Vienna, take Vienna, if you're gonna go big or go home, and you look at the failures of Putin, because Matt is right, Putin is much less uh, uh, capable than China, you, you make sure you get it right. And if you're gonna do that, you generate as much surprise as possible. Now, that has a kind of coherence that could lead you into a cul-de-sac analytically, but I think what that means is that we should be prepared militarily, and I know we'll get to the issue of trade-offs, and that's where I fundamentally disagree with Deputy Secretary Campbell, but that means that I, I think we have to be urgently concerned, and we are now in the window where invasion could happen almost at any time. I, I'm not saying I think it's gonna happen tomorrow. I think it may be more likely out, out later into the decade as to, to add a, fa a factor, a couple factors to Bonnie's, and then I'll stop. One is the military balance, I call this the Tom Shugart window, a friend of mine, Matt knows as well, retired Navy captain who testified a few years ago, pointing out that the military balance in the, the Western Pacific might peak from China's point of view. And we have Dale Realag here, other people know this very, very well. That's one thing, if you're gonna do, you know, that's why Hitler went in 1939, you go multiple his, examples in history. And of course, Xi Jinping's own personal clock, right? I mean, he is, I guess, 71, maybe 70, 71, something like that. He's not a spring chicken. You don't want to be 80, right? So I'm not, again, I'm not saying that's determinative, but I'm saying we now have to act as if we're there and then we'll get in the third on, session on, why military balance is key so to resolving that. I am cognizant of time. Okay. Um, and I ask our but. panelists to be as well. So uh, that's a great answer. Um, <laughs> It's a great answer, uh, but I- You asked a lot of questions though, come uh, on. I, I, I asked two, but that's okay. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, this is a good transition point to the question of trade-offs, but before we get there, I think the articulation bridge that you sort of made about the urgency here, I do think that's widely shared, including in the administration. I think there may be some differences on what we will see when. 
Okay. And that's where, you know, I think maybe I find Bonnie's analysis on quarantines quite interesting and, and useful because I think in the near term, my own personal assessment, not using any kind of other assessment mechanisms, but it is my own personal assessment is that those kinds of scenarios are, are, are really concerning and in the immediate term, mm. likely and perhaps under theorized. So that, I found that paper helpful. Let's move on now to the kind of, uh, and I'll turn back to you, Bridge, to okay. start us off. The question of probably briefer. Uh, no, that's okay. You've set it up so you can right. now uh, yeah, you know, answer tight. directly on target. But strategy is about, of course, aligning yeah. uh, ends with means. And I'd like to spend some time on this in our discussion, because I think this is an area of substantial disagreement. And as we just discussed, the US faces the risk of very serious conflict uh, in the Taiwan Strait, as the De Deputy Secretary mentioned, in the South China Sea as well. There's, of course, ongoing war in Europe and the Middle East. And at the same time, we're witnessing this tightening alignment that the Deputy Secretary spoke about, China, Russia, DPRK, and Iran. So. You've made the case, Bridge, that the U.S. might need to pull back in some places, a burden share more in places, Ukraine, possibly the Middle East, to focus surge attention really on Taiwan scenarios and in the Indo-Pacific because we are far behind. Uh, I think you've said that some caricature your position unfairly as saying we should completely abandon Ukraine. I think I'll give you a chance to respond to that critique. Uh, so I guess my question to you is if that isn't your position, what specifically do you want to see the United States and its allies and partners do in Ukraine and in the Middle East so that the U.S. can focus more on the Indo-Pacific? Well, I'll just start where, where you ended, and it's a caricature, but it's, it's the thrust of it is, is basically true, which is that we cannot allow our focus, and it's sort of paradoxical to see the father of the pivot now basically in my, you know, with respect, from my point of view, actually arguing for the reverse, which is that everything is interconnected. I would say no, a couple things. If the threat is urgent and imminent, what is what can realistically stop it? And I think to be simplistic about it, but I think it's true, and here's where I agree with Mike Gallagher very much, it's going to be hard power in the right place at the right time. It ain't going to be economic sanctions. They're, they're completely failing against China. And that's another area where I think I've been interested to hear what Deputy Secretary Campbell has to say, because the administration has been saying this whole policy, but now he's admitting, basically, that China has propped up uh, Russia, right? Economic sanctions are not stopping uh, 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 Russia or, or China from doing the critical, the critical things. I do not believe that given the resolve of the Chinese leadership and the capacity of the Chinese economy and military and the you know, sort of authoritarian political structure that we would be able to impose economic, let alone sort of soft power costs on China that would uh, defeat a determined attack on Taiwan. Now we can argue whether it may be better as a deterrent. I'm prepared to concede a little bit of that, but I think basically it's gonna be hard military power at the right place in the right time. And the one thing that I really disagree and I think is fun, just wrong that Campbell said is that all the money and the weapons capability that we have sent to Ukraine and Europe would not have helped in the Asia Pacific. That is facially ridiculous, I'm sorry. And you see the president now has basically shifted towards prioritizing. Now he said Taiwan is not gonna be affected. Of course, the Indo-Pacific is, is a much bigger issue. You gotta have Philippines, Japan, et cetera, uh, defended as well. But I think if it's true that we need to be ready at any time, we should be moving as, as much as possible. And for anybody who follows the Biden administration's own defense strategy recognizes we do not have a multi-war military. Don't take it from me. The Rand Corporation itself has assessed we're on the trajectory to lose over Taiwan. And we, you know, multiple Navy programs are delayed. The defense industrial base is not fixed. So I find a lot, of, especially from people like Kirk Campbell, I find it kind of shocking that you're saying, oh, to, to and get to Ukraine. And, and if the theaters are interconnected, if the theaters are interconnected, this actually strengthens the need to priority, prioritize because we actually have to assume that they're gonna act collaboratively precisely to deplete us. What does this mean in Ukraine? Well, I've been saying it to the Europeans for the last couple of years. We need to give you clear warning about what we actually can do. I don't have a theological opposition to supporting Ukraine if I had endless we, resources. Should, should we cut Ukraine aid? And well, I would, I would, basically, as I wrote in my Time Magazine article last year, mm -hmm. I would allocate money first on the, for something like the supplemental. I would say, let's put 61 billion in the Indo-Pacific and well, as Mike Gallagher said, two billion for Taiwan or something like, you know, 10 billion or whatever for Ukraine capabilities, as my friend Austin Dahmer and I have written about, if, uh, uh, if they manifestly are not relevant for a first island chain scenario, Abrams tanks, F-16s, I've supported F-16s, mm -hmm. these kinds of things. But the key thing, and this is another thing where I think both the administration and a lot of Republicans have erred and have not done the Europeans any favors, is we are dealing with scarcity and the Europeans do need to step up and they need to do so urgently. And that's only going to happen if we're clear with them. And that's one of the things that I've been okay. trying to do. So uh, yes or no, then on, on further dollars in Ukraine, it's, it's basically- Well, smaller. Yeah, small. But okay. yeah, I mean, we should be basically reversing- So the, the April 60 billion should not have happened. Yeah, I oppose that supplemental. I'm not saying that we should give, you could have a supplemental that's 60 billion for, for First Island chain and 10 billion for Ukraine. Isn't that prioritizing? If it were 60 that's and 60 and you didn't prioritize, would you support that? Well, the 60 and 60, that's the, the problem there is if the Congress is willing to do something like that, then you, you support see, it. 
Well, no, because I'm not saying that I would support it. Okay, so then it's not. It's well, wait, again, hold on, Rush. There, there, there are real, there are real I'm fiscal issues. Answer. There are real fiscal issues in this country. Right. Okay. We do so have. We'll, no, we'll come back to that. Okay. Got yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's an important. So, it, so there so are trade under that under that thing, scarcity. There should be priority. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I'll come back to that question, but I want to give Matt a chance to weigh in, and I think I'll weigh in myself now. <laughs> um, but 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 Matt, I think um, you already have my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I just asked questions, uh, but I will weigh in. Matt, over to you. I know you have strong views on this as well. Yeah. Look, it, 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 let's just zoom out for a moment. Again, remember what I what I was saying before. The United States and its allies, its treaty allies, are a sixty trillion dollar collective economy. Okay, if you take the axis of chaos, which is China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, plus I would add, you know, Venezuela and and, and Cuba as a couple wannabes in the axis of chaos, their combined economies are about one third. So we are three times their economies. If you remove China from it, we're like 25 times their economies. Yet, if you look at what the axis of chaos is spending on its defense, it is almost equal to what the United States uh, spent last year on defense. I, 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 that's my back of the envelope looking at Public Info Plus. I'm using the American Enterprise Institute's estimate that China is probably spending around $700 billion in, in actuality on its on its uh, uh, military. So that's, that, all that adds up to about $806 billion. We, we spent uh, only a little bit more than that last year. Why, why not actually take a deep breath, look at the fact that we have radically greater economic power, we have more, more innovative uh, businesses, and, and actually start increasing uh, our defense spending while also addressing the very real uh, uh, problems with the way our defense, it's not just the funding level as Bridge is alluding to, it's actually the way that, that we've allowed our uh, defense industry to sort of, I would say, Sovietize you know, over, the, over the course of the last uh, 20 years. Um, this is fixable. And so I, I, I agree with Bridge that hard power is, is really what it's going to boil down to. I agree with him that the main theater is uh, the Indo-Pacific. I'm not opposed to the idea of, of of rebalancing some of the spending, certainly more heavily towards Taiwan. In fact, Mike Gallagher and I wrote about uh, a, a deterrence fund of $20 billion a year just for dealing with this primary problem of deterring China in the Western Pacific. Uh, but I think this is doable. We're spending historically low levels on defense right now, 3.1% and, and shrinking uh, our, our defense budget's shrinking. The size of our active duty military is smaller than it's been at any point since the since the eve of World War II. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is irresponsible. We can increase that spending while also uh, addressing some of the the systemic problems that Bridges wrote and written well about uh, with with defense. Well, thanks, Matt. I'm going to turn to Bonnie and if you want to jump in on this at all, and then I'll make a quick intervention. Bridget, I'll give you the last okay. word on this, and we'll move to a final topic before Q&A. To my uh, colleagues in the meetings and events teams, we're going to push this panel back maybe five to eight more minutes since we started a bit late because of the liveliness of the discussion. But Bonnie, over to you. Great, thank you. I guess I'll just add on to the points that both Bridge and Matt has made. Uh, in terms of thinking about whether how, how to prioritize between theaters, China is very much observing what's happening in Ukraine. China recognizes that Ukraine is not Taiwan, but for some reason, uh, it's taking away lessons learned from Ukraine as if Ukraine was Taiwan. So if Ukraine were to fall and if the conflict was to end quickly versus longer term, I think that would in some ways shape how the Chinese think about how easy it may be to take Taiwan. And I would note that when we look at the perspective also from my Taiwan friends, Taiwan is incredibly vocal in saying the importance yeah. of supporting Ukraine because they also recognize that even though they are not Ukraine, they're very different from Ukraine, they're very worried about what are the wrong lessons learned being taken and how Russian action in Ukraine may shape um, perceptions of how force could be used. The final thing I'll add is to your point, uh, uh, Bridge, you mentioned that uh, I agree I agree with you, both you and Matt in saying that hard power is the most determinant. But if we were to give economic, uh, if we were to think about any way to deter China, we have to add in the economics part of the equation. And to Matt's point, we have to be able to work with our European allies and partners on that. And the one final point I'll add is we can't assume if we were to 
to really think about the defense of Taiwan, that that would not that would be a short war. It could be a very protracted war. If it is a protracted war, and we assume that in that beginning of that war, that China would strike and probably take out not only some of our facilities in the Indo-Pacific, but also the capabilities of many of our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific, we would need partners outside of the Indo-Pacific. And that's where having our European allies and partners and partners outside of the region will be absolutely critical to, sit, to sustain our fight there. Well, thanks, Bonnie. Um, uh, kind of building on that, I'll just maybe offer two broad questions to Bridge, and then you can react uh, to the questions, to the comments so far. And we'll have more time Q&A, hopefully, uh, if we can move quickly. The, uh, I guess the question that you and I were just getting at mm -hmm. was about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a big part of CFR's work, actually. We're going to have a major section of work on trade-offs across mm -hmm. all of these four initiatives. Right. So that's one of, the, one of the reasons we wanted to spend time on this question. Um, and Matt Goodman's uh, project uh, on the economic questions has, has you know, a ton of work on trade-offs already. The amount that the U.S. has spent on, I think, as a percentage of GDP on Ukraine is 0.16%. Mm -hmm. 0.16%. So that's less than we spent supporting Israel in 1979. And much of that money that we're spending on Ukraine is recapitalizing the defense industrial base anyway. Now you could argue it could be even better spent, but that's still happening. It's reality. I think the other question, the other critique you could make is that what we're transferring to Ukraine could be valuable for Taiwan. And I think if you go item by item, most of what's being transferred to Ukraine is relevant for land war it's not an air defense, not necessarily relevant for Taiwan scenarios, but there are some exceptions. And if you look at those exceptions, HIMARS, ATACMS, NASAMS, Harpoons, those amounts are relatively small being transferred to Ukraine. There's still plenty of depth in US stocks for all of that, which is an important fact. So the, I, when I look at that, I think to myself, is this as unsustainable as you've argued? Could you, for example, do, and, and as Matt has suggested and Bonnie has suggested, 60 billion to Ukraine and without breaking a sweat, issue more you know, debt, essentially, to do 60 billion for the Indo-Pacific? Could you do both? And I guess the question is, based on what I've just outlined in terms of the numbers, the answer seems to be yes, but we can debate that. The second question is, what signal would it send to the PRC? This is what Bonnie's question gets to, her point gets to, and to the American people if we were trenched too hastily in Ukraine, if we, as you suggest, just cut the spending right off the bat. Um, I think China does watch our politics closely. As somebody who studies the PRC, I think they watch the politics for signals of resolve. And I think that the marginal decrease in capability from a few more NASAMs going to Ukraine is small compared to the marginal loss in the credibility of our resolve if they think our politics can't get it together. So that's a big trade-off. Mm -hmm. I guess a final component of that is another audience, which is the American people. And you're, you, you, you talk about realism, and that's an excellent way to think about things, but realism is contested. And Americans have different views. Mm -hmm. I guess if you want to mobilize Americans to focus on Taiwan and to do the things you care about that we've all talked about on this panel to really mobilize for the defense of Taiwan. Can you do that with a clever argument saying, well, let's cut here, here, and here. Will they still come along for the ride on Taiwan? So that's kind of my mm -hmm. fiscal concern, my resolve concern, I guess my mobilization concern. It builds on some of what Matt and Bonnie said, and I give you the last word. Great, well, thanks. I don't think my strategy is particularly clever. Like it's sort of needed, it's sort of more hedgehoggy. It's kind of like simple, you know, sort of parsimonious. It's basically like, if this is the biggest threat and we're all agreed about that and hard power is the most important thing, why are we not focusing on that? I think the clever argument is a triple bank shot. All these art theaters are interconnected. Like somehow you're going to deter China over, over Taiwan and Ukraine. That's the more sort of sophisticated. My argument is in some ways is actually, I would say, more straightforward. On the, on the trade-offs, I, I just I, I disagree on a couple of things. One, I do think that the weapons in question for Patriots air defense are very critical and they do trade against. And by the way, of course, a Taiwan fight is going to be a ground fight and it's going to be an air defense fight. I mean, they are definitely going to get ashore in an invasion, right? So that has to be part of it. And more throughout the defense industrial base, there are huge trade-offs given the atrophy of our defense industrial base that Matt has talked about, that where, where there are trade-offs and we are now reorienting with a, a lot of expense, we've reoriented a lot on Ukraine, right? The money is for Ukraine. And, it, and there is some, you know, sort of scaling uh, abilities, but I think there are sort of advantages, but I think those scaling uh, uh, efficiencies from investments or defense industrial base are way over, way, uh, overwhelmed by the fact that we're focusing on, on the war in Ukraine. And apropos of Matt's comments about how Russia is a joke and we're so much richer, well, it's such a joke. Unfortunately, it's got the upper hand and it's outproducing us by like almost an order of at least several factors in, the, uh, in, in artillery shells. So I think, look, and I mean, you know, I both worked in government. Um, I think when, when you look at the state of our military and people actually deal with it, it is not in the condition. There's a prominent member of Congress who I saw race recently who's a pro-defense guy. He said this, the readiness of our armed forces is atrocious, right? They're steady, the, 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 the state of our defense industrial base is equivalently atrocious. So, you know, look, 
do, that's why I stress the point about being theological. If you came in and you said, all right, I get what you're saying, but look, there's still a lot out there. And that's why I wrote that time piece and why I've tried to be consistent about things like F-16s that there's no way they're going to survive against Chinese integrated air defenses. But things like the attention of the defense industrial base, I mean, people, prominent Republican members of the Senate saying all this money is not a lot of money. Of course, it's a lot of money. And my rejoinder back to you on the trade-offs and 60 billion is, well, why didn't you do it then? You know, if there had been 60 billion for the Indo-Pacific and we're linked to Ukraine, well, then I would say, well, that's great because that's the most important thing we need. If that's what the American people were supporting, that's not what we're dealing with. Yeah. And now we've gotten to a point where I can certainly say for Republicans, I mean, I don't speak. But for if Republicans, we could get Congress to give the 60 on both, would well, you I would, support, I, would like, I would, I would, I would prefer. I, I want to get 60 billion or a lot of money for the Indo-Pacific. Then Ukraine's good. I actually, but of course, I'm also yeah. supportive of, of of Ukraine. But I'm looking at the reality of the defense industrial base and how we're doing. And I'm saying th the other thing is. To get back to the clever point, I think this is important, is my thing is let's be clear about where our priority is, and then we can moderate that. They say, okay, Bridge, that's a little extreme. Let's go 80% of that. That's a much better place than saying, hey, we can do everything, but actually we're going to try to get a little margin for, for the first island chain. That's not going to work. And I think, again, if it, the other point is it could happen tomorrow. It could happen in five years, but that's within the five years defense program. It takes years to field new capabilities. And Matt is right. And the point I would say to Matt is, we got to live in the real world. We ain't going to double defense spending. Our defense industrial base is not going to be overhauled from one day to the next. In fact, in some ways, it's getting worse. We got to live in the world as it is. And that is the world in which China can move. Welcome to the Council on Foreign Relations. <laughs> <laughs> we convene the real, the real debates. All right. Well, thanks. There's a lot more to say here. I know Matt would want to get back in. And, and we, hopefully, there'll be a chance in Q&A with the audience. I want to give them a chance, too. What you ended on with the defense industrial base, uh, base brings me to the like, final part of this discussion, which is the home front. And there's a lot to talk about here and not a lot of time. But, <laughs> but I think this is an area where there might be actually more agreement. And, and where some of the problems are structural and actually where the China Strategy Initiative, as you saw, will be very focused. So um, let me begin with this question of capacity building in the United States. And maybe, Matt, I'll quickly start with you, since you've written about this most recently in Foreign Affairs. And in my response to you, I actually agreed with most, if not all, of the things that you suggested that we do on the home front, uh, with some modest disagreement on whether or not they're being undertaken by the Biden administration. So maybe I'll turn to you. I think I just put one little wrapper on this before I kind of kick off this portion, which is that a lot of the discussion of foreign policy questions is really about what happens abroad. And that's appropriate because it is foreign policy. But everything we're able to do there has a kind of domestic you know, component that underlies it, that creates the strength for it, whether that's, as we've talked about, Bridge, just now the defense industrial base, our economy, our technological leadership, our political cohesion as a society, which you know it, we are very divided. So Matt, over to you perhaps to give us some sense of what you think are the most important steps to do at home in domestic policy to be more effective abroad in China competition. Yeah. So just one one quick thing, just going back to to sure, sure, and of course, yeah. No, no, yeah. no. It, it, it's just the following. If we think of of this, and this is this is related to your question too, Rush. Okay. President Biden has added has initiated four point six trillion dollars in new spending while he's been president. Four point six trillion in new spending above, <laughs> the, you know, this is discretional uh, um, discretionary spending. Uh, that uh, none of none of which is going into defense. A, a, a big chunk of that went into pandemic response. I don't think that was necessary uh, that late in the pandemic, but we, we can argue about that. Um, it, it's been for infrastructure projects. He wants to do hundreds of billions of dollars in student, you know, uh, uh, loan uh, uh, amnesty. I mean, four point six trillion dollars is almost six times our entire defense budget. I mean, how how even if even if we're not going to double our defense spending, to your point, Bridge, Mike Gallagher and I call for going from three point one percent to four percent or even five percent, which would still be significantly lower than our defense spending was as a percentage of GDP uh, during the Cold War. It was about six point eight percent at its peak during the Reagan years. Reagan didn't get us into any new wars, excluding Grenada, <laughs> and and actually brought the Cold War to a uh, a peaceful ending. So I, I I think that this is a big part of it. Uh, look, I I'll give you I'll give you a, a crazy idea, uh, Rush, which is okay. What what about finding uh, powerful new ways to incentivize uh, military service and other forms of public service? Um, you know, no one no one that I served with in the military, people who were who who had memories 
of the Vietnam War, the generals that I knew when I was a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. No one wants to go back to the Vietnam War era model, but you could have a model where um, people have the option in doing national service of serving in the military. They could decide whether they want to be in combat arms or not. So you're not pushing kids who don't want to be there uh, to, to, the, to the front in wars, but there's an enormous amount of work that could be done more cheaply uh, by bringing uh, more Americans, young Americans into mandatory or at least heavily incentivized um, uh, military service and other forms of national service. I'll throw that one out there on your uh, home front question. Okay, all right, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Not one you put in the foreign affairs piece, but an interesting one. Bonnie, maybe over to you. Anything you wanna jump in on? No. no okay. Um, uh, Bridge, over to you. On just the really point. briefly. And actually, if I could ask, uh, yeah. and Matt, if you want to come back yeah, later, not sure. just the military side, but also economic and technology. Yeah. yeah. So I'll be I'll be very brief. I mean, I think one of the kind of fundamentals of my approach is you kind of have to meet the American people largely where they are. You can move them, but I think particularly on the Republican side, there's a lot of rhetoric that says, "Hey, we can just convince them if, if Reagan is rebooted and we bring him out from Madame Tussauds or something, we'll convince the American people to go to 10 percent <laughs> defense spending." And as people point out, we're about you know we're over we're, we're heading on uh, over 100 uh, percent uh, debt to GDP. Uh, the, the American people are war weary, and actually a lot of the people in the, who serve in the military are quite skeptical or even cynical about it and so forth. So I'm, I'm in the mode of kind of husbanding the asks. And so in that respect, I do think some defense spending increases are going to be necessary. And if the American people support it, great, that would make our, our problems easier on this front. But I think the number one thing that I would really focus on, this gets to your question, is defense, national uh, mobilization of our defense industrial base as part of a larger industrial uh, reindustrialization. I think this would be a great initiative, I hope for President Trump if he's elected, but even for Democrats to say, you can buy off not only a, a hard hat Republicans and Democrats, people who are national security hawks, but it can't be seen. And one of the one of the things I've seen with the supplemental arguments, for instance, is people are very cynical now where they say, well, why am I, you know, we're, we're spending money and giving it to Lockheed shareholders or Raytheon or whatever. If it's part of a broader reindustrialization, which people want and which would be beneficial anyway in things like ships and so forth, depending on how you conceive it. But that would allow us to get back to a defense industry where we don't have to have these terrible trade-off issues where we can say, here's, here you go, Israel, here you go, Ukraine, here you go, Taiwan, here you go, Korea, no problem. But that's not the world we're in right now. So um, I have one final question. We'll move to Q&A. We're going to go over by 10 minutes. I know that's going to cut into our break, but we, we people can take a five-minute break and then we'll, we'll have the next panel start a little bit later. We'll be just fine. So um, I guess what I would offer is uh, the question of U.S. competition with China isn't just a military question, although that's the one we have focused a lot on in this panel. And when you ask about the $4 trillion in spending, I think you could probably criticize elements of it. But I think the ultimate intention was to catalyze a recovery, which has you know, produced massive amounts of growth and employment in a way that most of Europe was not able to achieve because of their greater restraint on the fiscal stimulus side. But the other part of it, if you take the infrastructure legislation, which was bipartisan, the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as uh, Chips and Science, which was bipartisan, uh, and then, you know, and the pandemic recovery assistance, all of it together has focused on an economic and technology bet, which is that if we're going to win the future as Americans, we have to not just recapitalize the defense industrial base, but to do that, well, we have to recapitalize the larger defense, uh, rather in, larger industrial base of the country, because those things transfer across each other. We have to be able to make semiconductors again. We have to be able to design semiconductors at the leading edge for the foreseeable future. We have to be able to fix our critical infrastructure and defend it from cyber attack. There's many, many other things in addition to the kind of nuts and bolts of sort of military questions. And in fact, all those things reinforce. So that would be kind of my quick answer. And when I turn to what CFR will be doing in this space, we are setting up a China policy accelerator with the idea to actually probably the first project we'll take on will be the defense industrial base. Okay. But the questions beyond it are, how do you do industrial policy the right way in legacy semiconductors and electric vehicles? It's to solve those technology problems which we didn't have a chance to get to today. I have a final question for our group, and I'd like you to keep your answers to maybe just a few sentences if you could. It's a tough question. Here's the wind up. Uh, it's about the American people, which we've talked a lot about and we've spoken in their name, but here's what they actually think. In April, Pew surveyed Americans for their foreign policy priorities in the US, long-term priorities. First was preventing terrorist attacks. Second was stopping the flow of drugs. Third was preventing the spread of WMD. Fourth was maintaining military primacy. So that kind of dovetails with what we're talking about. Fifth was reducing infectious disease spread. Sixth was countering Russian power and influence. And only seventh was countering Chinese power and influence. Now that is up 17 points on China from 2018, but it still comes in seventh. So my question to all of you, and I'll start maybe with you, Bonnie, if you'd like to, well, maybe 
or or not, it's up to you. Uh, Bonnie, if I can put you on the spot, I'll start with you. My question is, are the American people right to put America, rather countering China as number seven? And what argument would you make to them? And you've written about this in your work on Taiwan and other issues. Why should they care about China policy? What's the argument you'd make to them? Huh. Uh, that's a really tough question, Rush. Um, I guess I can't say whether the American people are right or not. I, I, everyone has their own uh, decision and can make their own decisions. I do think, I do find it very odd that the assessment that the China threat is less than the Russian threat. Um, I think what we probably need is a better education of the American people of the general threat that China poses, not only in terms of the military threats, which people may be, uh, believe are much more far, much more distant, but the extent to which uh, China's economic competition, China's unfair trade and other economic practices are harming American businesses and how that's also impacting jobs in America. So I think if we uh, better educate the American public, I think there probably may be a greater awareness. I, I agree, like most people probably can't find Taiwan on a map. But that doesn't mean that's the only threat and challenge that China poses to the United States. That's an excellent point. There's an economic component, a tech component, there's fentanyl. There's a lot of other issues related to China uh, that people increasingly do pay attention to. So Bridge, you talked about meeting the people, American people, yeah. where they are. What's your sort of pitch to the American people for why they should care about China? Sure. I, I would quibble a little bit with the wording and obviously with different different uh, uh, polls, you can get different things. For instance, I know, for instance, 67% of Republicans see China as the top threat. I think I, the, way, yeah. the way I pose it, is China is the one country, and actually the Biden administration, I'm sure you played an important hand in this, is the only uh, state that can, uh, you know, sort of reform and dominate the future world. I can't remember exactly what it yeah. is. But basically, that is the, the prospect. And so countering Chinese influence sounds kind of vague to me. I'm not sure I would put that that high. Okay. And that's where maybe I differ from some of the more expansive versions of the competition with China. Mine is relatively narrow, and it gets back to your point about the economic. It's not that I, the last thing I want is a war. I genuinely would hate to see a war for obvious reasons. But I think if we get, like in the Cold War, if we get the military balance right, the rest of the things will become more material. I analogize it to, you know, police in a neighborhood. If you if you have a safe neighborhood, you can worry about commercial development and the state of the park or your schools, et cetera. If there's, not, if there's bad crime, that's the number one thing you worry about. And I think, I actually think the American people get that. I think where the debate, at least more on the Republican sort of center right side that, you know, I'm maybe more attuned to is on where do we draw that line and how prepared are people to go into what could be World War III over Taiwan? And I, God forbid, and I really don't want that to happen. And that's another point just to kind of maybe finish is why I'm so focused on the trade-offs is because I think given how distant it is and most people don't know or care about Taiwan necessarily and for, for reasonable uh, you know, reasons, um, is to make sure that we can win that fight within reason, achieve denial at a relatively low cost, rather than something where we're going to have to blow up the American economy to save Taiwan. I'm very skeptical the American people are going to go for that. Okay. Matt, uh, the last word on this question, and then we'll take uh, three audience questions to kind of wrap us out. So, Sure, yeah, I, I, won't, I won't add much except to say that, you know, the, uh, American polls, uh, I know that Pew last year had a poll that said half of Americans view China as the greatest threat, while only about 17% view Russia as the greatest threat. I think the American people uh, are, are uh, get it. They understand this because Russia would not be a threat uh, if not for uh, Xi Jinping having Vladimir Putin's back and being the, the main diplomatic propaganda and material supporter of the biggest war in Europe since World War II. I think, I think Americans already get it. Um, I, I, I have a poll that I just pulled up that 80, this is also Pew, 81% of Americans, and this is, this is overall, it cr crosses every demographic, have a negative view of China, and over half the public believes that, quote, limiting the power and influence of China should be a top priority for U.S. foreign policy. So I think the American people don't need much more convincing. They, they, they get, they've seen the face of, uh, you know, the true face of, of this regime in Beijing under its current leader. Well, thanks, Matt. I hope you and Bridge are right. Um, although this was asking sort of how you rank different goals over, you know, so they may say, all right, China's the, you know, we're very concerned about this. 80% are, you know, disapproving. But when they ranked them, this is where they came out. That being said, to Bridge's excellent point, polls, you know, the wording can be quibbled with. But I think Bonnie's suggestion, which is more education on this issue, is always useful, more discussion and debate. I think that's where we come out. I'd like to take three questions from the audience. Those will be our final three. You'll each have a chance to pick and choose your answers to which ones you want to take on. And then we will go to our break. So uh, let's start here in the front and then uh, to Ali in the back. Hi, I'm Jim Mann, author based at SICE. Uh, so if we're talking about trade-offs, would you, can we afford to let the Trump tax cuts uh, expire? <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, Jim, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> so I didn't have to. All right, uh, we've got Allie Wynn next. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Good morning. Uh, Ali Wan with the International uh, Crisis Group. Rush, congratulations on the launch of the initiative. We've heard a lot this morning about the competitive strides that China has made in recent years. We've also heard a lot about some of China's competitive weaknesses, uh, slowing growth, growing mobilization of advanced industrial democracies against it. Do you think that Xi Jinping, in light of recent trends, do you think that he maintains an underlying sense of optimism about China's capacity to achieve its objectives, or has he grown more pessimistic in recent years? Great question. Um, and in the back, uh, at the aisle, um, or right behind the aisle, I suppose. It's hard to tell. <laughs> that hand that's still up, that one. <laughs> there you go. No. <clears throat> yes, and with the Voice of America. How does Putin Kim summit impact the um, security situation in Northeast Asia? And is that a plus or a minus in the US-China competition where this could be an area that they, the two sides can seek more cooperation or does it work for China, China's benefit that these countries are all aligning together? Okay, so we'll start maybe okay. with you, Bridge, uh, then Bonnie, and then Matt, over to you. Well, uh, Jim, to your question, I'm not an economist. I'm not, I don't claim any expertise and I certainly don't, don't speak for anybody but myself, but I, I think if you know Republicans are obviously more in favor of, of extending uh, tax cuts, Democrats are more in favor of, of greater domestic spending. In any case, that just reinforces the need for prioritization and realism about about how much we can really expect from increases in defense spending. I don't think that's a, a very plausible and thus credible. And I don't think a, even a Republican administration, you know, just even as an analyst, I don't think it's very plausible that it would. Uh, initiate enormous increases in defense spending, and, and neither of the candidates is running or, or is running on that on that platform. Ali, to your question, I mean, I, I'm skeptical about that. I'm prepared to believe that it may be somewhat true. Um, I, you know, I just, I, I guess it's my my personality, but I, I prefer to prepare for the downside risk that they're actually better than we are, and they have all kinds of advantages of numbers, resolve, position, initiative, etc. So I think you know there there may be some truth there. The other problem is that, and again, I don't know but you could kind of read it both ways. But the fact that Xi Jinping is purging the top leaders of the PLA and actually going to the PLA and saying, I need you to be ready, suggests to me that he's serious about it. Like, I don't think Jiang Zemin would have actually done that. I found this, people were yeah. saying, I don't know who was the leaker to Bloomberg about six months or a year ago, but said, oh, they have ICB, water in their ICBM and they don't have any confidence. They purged their leaders. They're never going to declare war. Hitler purged the high command of Germany in early 1939. So it's like, you know, maybe, that, maybe that's because they're serious. I don't think that tells you one way or the other. But again, it gets back to my epistemological approach, which is, I don't think we know, but the, 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 the fundamentals that we see are very worrisome. Unjong, to your, your question, I think it's very bad because I think it's gonna increase, contrary to what Kurt Campbell is suggesting, it's gonna increase the fact where we're getting depleted and we have legacy commitments that are way bigger than our ability to substantiate them along concurrent timelines. And then as we've discussed on your important show, I think it's also gonna undermine the Washington Declaration, which I don't find credible, and the viability of American extended deterrence when what is it that Kim Jong-un probably wants from, from uh, Vladimir Putin? Probably missile and nuclear technology. Exactly what they'll give, we, we probably won't know, but we have to assume it's not gonna be good for us. Okay, thanks, Bridge. Uh, Bonnie, over to you. Okay, sure. Um, I'll, I'll address two of the questions. So Ali, on your question about whether Xi Jinping is optimistic or pessimistic, from what I'm seeing is you're seeing more and more rhetoric coming from China that uh, that emphasize the headwinds, but it hasn't changed any of China's long-term goals. It hasn't changed any major actions or activities on China's end. So my sense is they understand the challenges that they face, but that uh, it's really hard to get into Xi Jinping's head, but I haven't seen any indication that that is going to change any of Xi Jinping's behaviors. So I would say that largely probably China is still optimistic in the long-term trends, but probably um, realizes that they have short-term uh, challenges to do uh, to deal with. In terms of the Putin-Kim summit and implications for China, uh, what I would say there is that I think China is put in a somewhat difficult spot because it does recognize longer term that Russia's ambitions for the Korean Peninsula uh, is quite different from that of China's. Um, Russia is generally more willing to tolerate a greater level of instability and perhaps a nuclear North Korea, whereas China has traditionally in the past been more wary of that. But we have been seeing subtle changes in China's uh, position on this. So I'll point to the 2024 uh, Xi-Putin joint statement in which the paragraph on North Korea compared to 2023 was almost completely ta taking the side of North Korea against the United States. That was not the case in the 2023 uh, statement. And China also downplayed the role of the need for complete denuclearization in the uh, China 
um, Japan ROK joint statement, which is comp- different from four years ago. So we are seeing China being put in a more difficult position, but uh, the unfortunate reality is China is siding more and more with Russia and North Korea. Thank you, Bonnie. And Matt, uh, over to you. Yeah, it, it, this is one of the, the, the weird uh, historical um, symmetries that we're seeing right now, whereas in 1950, you had Europe and, and Soviet Russia providing most of the armaments uh, for a war on the Korean Peninsula. Now, now you have North Korea and South Korea as primary suppliers of, uh, of the two sides of the war that's playing out right now uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Um, the, uh, Ali, your, your question is, is important in a way. The, the, uh, this idea of optimism, I think, is, is actually really important. Is, Historians who've spent a lot of time looking at the causes of war over, over the course of the last four or five centuries have found that one of the one of the common indicators right before aggression actually breaks out is uh, overweening optimism on the on the part of an aggressor. And uh, I think that Xi Jinping, uh, I agree with Bonnie's uh, way that she laid it out. He he seems to be very optimistic in the long term sort of. Uh, uh, infallibility of his belief that that China's uh, dominance is inevitable, um, but is dealing with these headwinds right now. Anything that we can do to increase headwinds and to cause him to to have some doubts uh, about whether this is the right timing uh, would be something in in the service of peace. So rather than being provocative, anything we do to undermine the sources of Chinese power right now would be a cause for peace, in my view. Mm-hmm.